Um, uh, and the people who are losing their lives, or some of the people who are losing their lives, um, are totally innocent bystanders. Right? Maybe we don't worry about what some have called extrajudicial extra execution, extrajudicial killing of Al Qaeda members. Right? Maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. But I think we can all agree that uh, collateral damage inflicted on wives, children, uh, siblings, innocent bystanders um, is a real cost of uh, uh, targeted killing. The second possible substitute for a modestly coercive interrogation program is rendition. Um, my time has expired, so I'll breeze through this in just 30 seconds. Um, the basic idea here is if we can't interrogate Osama bin Laden uh, meaningfully, we'll simply ask the Saudis to do it, or the Egyptians to do it, uh, or the Syrians to do it. Um, why is rendition bad? Well, because the Egyptian intelligence service, and the Saudi intelligence service, and the Syrian intelligence service don't exactly share our scruples when it comes to torture. Uh, not to diminish uh, the severity of waterboarding, but that's child's play to what takes place uh, at the hands of the Egyptians. We're talking about uh, electrodes affixed to very sensitive parts of the body, fingernails being ripped off, um, and, and other sorts of abuses. Um, all of those abuses that result from rendition are now, I would argue, marginally more likely to occur because the United States lacks the capacity to use a mildly coercive set of interrogation techniques to extract information on our own. Right? My bottom line is, uh, coercive interrogation is nobody's dream, it's nobody's ideal system. However, there are certain things that are worse than modestly coercive interrogation. There are certain things that are worse than Mutt and Jeff and solitary confinement. Right? And maybe we're willing to pay the price um, of using mildly coercive interrogation in order to avoid truly atrocious uh, civil liberties violations, um, such as deaths of innocent bystanders uh, and torture at the hands of foreign intelligence services. Thank you.
the rendition of people to other countries, to, to their interrogators, the rendition of people to other countries where we set up our own secret detention facilities. All of this has led to, uh, at the very least, a public relations disaster for the United States. Uh, uh, and uh, at the other end, uh, perhaps we have been fomenting the kind of, of, of anti-US violence that we have seen in such things as attacks on airplanes, the airplane in Detroit, uh, uh, for example. Um, uh, I think that there is some good reason to believe that we have fomented all that by the policies of, of, of torture, long-term detention, and, uh, 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 and rendition uh, abroad. Uh, so that uh, when you put together the, the low utility of doing it with the horrible consequences that we've created, it seems to me that it's a fairly simple question to say that, that what we've done is an absolute disaster. We now find the Obama administration trying to, to figure out uh, uh, how to clean up the mess. Uh, the Obama administration is doing it to some extent, not, not, not entirely effectively. Uh, the courts are dealing with it to some extent. There was a suit, for example, uh, against uh, a, a, a private uh, security company. Uh, went to the Ninth Circuit. Uh, it was decided by the Ninth Circuit a few weeks ago uh, where foreign nationals were suing the, the private security company uh, saying that they had been subjected to torture by operatives of the security company. The Ninth Circuit said that the case cannot go forward because it might result in the divulgence of state secrets. So, so it, it appears we're not going to get uh, civil suits by foreigners who have been subjected to torture uh, as any kind of, uh, of remedy. Um, but uh, we are getting uh, a good bit of reaction from foreign governments. Probably the most uh, 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 clear case of this uh, was what has occurred in Italy with regard to the uh, uh, kidnapping of someone who was suspected of having uh, actionable intelligence information. Uh, this occurred in 2003 on the streets of Milan. Bella was walking on the streets, people came along in a car, uh, whisked him off, took him to a military base, flew him to Germany, flew him from Germany to Egypt. He was in Egypt in detention for four years where he alleges he was tortured uh, uh, there. Uh, he was then released, uh, uh, and no one, uh, none of the authorities involved were able to figure out that he was involved in anything that, that, that would have warranted a criminal prosecution. So it was, it was apparently the wrong guy. Uh, but um, the, the, uh, the, the government of Italy apparently cooperated uh, in this, uh, but it was orchestrated by the, the CIA station in Milan. Uh, and 22 members, or perhaps 22 or maybe 23, uh, members of, of the CIA station in Milan uh, were prosecuted for this criminally. They were prosecuted for kidnapping because uh, the Italian uh, prosecuting authorities uh, regarded this as a, an ordinary crime under Italian law. Uh, um, uh, the CIA people were aware that this was about to happen or might happen. So immediately after the kidnapping went down, they got out of the country. Uh, so they weren't around to be prosecuted. They were prosecuted in absentia. Uh, the CIA station chief was sentenced to, uh, I think, eight years. And the others were sentenced to five years. Uh, uh, but of course, they're, they're in the United States. Um, this, of course, has, has, has uh, uh, not helped the careers of these people. I, I felt a certain amount of sympathy, actually, for the station chief. He was somebody who had been in Italy a long time, apparently loved Italian culture, was planning to retire, he bought a villa in the hills near Milan. Uh, uh, and I think he, like the others, were being pressured to do this from Langley, Virginia. They didn't want to carry out this operation. They were being told by the people in Langley that, that they had to do it. Um, uh, and I think that's been a, a continuing theme here. The people who subjected Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to waterboarding over a hundred times did not want to waterboard him. They didn't think he had anything useful to tell. They were being instructed to do this from Langley. Uh, and, and I think that's where the real fault lies in all this. It really lies at the top. It doesn't rely 
uh, it doesn't lie on the, the people who are, are actually carrying this out. Um, but, uh, but other countries, are, are not only Italy, are, are reacting to this. Uh, one of the countries that we apparently used was Poland. That is, Poland agreed that we could have a little place uh, where we could uh, interrogate people uh, secretly. Uh, and some of the Al-Qaeda people were taken there and interrogated. Um, uh, it apparently also happened in Romania. Um, uh, it happened in Morocco. Uh, and some of these countries are, are now investigating to see whether criminal acts were committed by their own personnel. So in Poland now, in particular, crossing authorities in Warsaw uh, have opened a criminal investigation to see if any uh, Polish officials were complicit with this in, uh, uh, in, in, in the perpetration of, of torture. The European Commission, which is the, uh, I'm sorry, the European Council, Council of Europe, which is an organization of European states, uh, has been investigating this uh, uh, at the European-wide level to see what European governments were involved in this. So, uh, for, from the standpoint of a negative reaction abroad, uh, this whole process uh, ha has really been a disaster for the United States. Um, uh, not to mention, the, the impact of such things as the photos that came out of the Abu Ghraib prison in, in Iraq, uh, which, which are ideal uh, recruitment material for the Al Qaeda organization. So if you like Al Qaeda, go ahead and torture people. Uh, you make it much easier for them to uh, to to recruit new people to to their cause. Um, but um, oh. The, the U.S. Supreme Court has tried to step in, has at least said that it has jurisdiction over these matters. The, the Bush administration tried to, to, uh, to get everything offshore in order to protect from habeas corpus. Uh, the Supreme Court has not let that happen, so, uh, so there, there is some possibility of, uh, of redress of the courts. Uh, but I think perhaps I should stop uh, at that point because we need to have some time for rebuttal and, and, and uh, some audience participation. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Quigley, for those uh, thought-provoking uh, comments. Um, um, I want to address two or maybe three of them, um, although I don't want to take up my entire ten minutes, because I'm more interested in, in, in hearing uh, what the audience has to say and engaging in a back-and-forth dialogue with Professor Quigley. Um, so the, the, f the first issue I'd like to address is the utility of torture or coercive interrogation. Uh, does it actually work? Does it actually yield intelligence that's useful? And, and more importantly, does it yield intelligence um, that couldn't be obtained through any other means, right? If not, then the debate is fairly simple, right? Um, we don't need to decide whether or not to do it, uh, whether or not doing it is moral, because it simply doesn't work. Um, I think Professor Wrigley is exactly right. We don't really know whether torture in particular, or more broadly, uh, coercive interrogation, is effective uh, in eliciting important, actionable intelligence. This is ultimately an empirical question, right? Does it work or not? Um, and unfortunately, the literature uh, is almost non-existent. Here's what we do know. We know that the CIA, or at least um, uh, CIA leadership, as well as individual CIA low-level interrogators, have publicly said, we think uh, the use of waterboarding and other coercive interrogation techniques save lives. Well, we also know that CIA officials have an incentive to say that, right? Because they want to defend publicly a program that has come under with withering criticism. We also know the FBI has said torture never works, um, and that we can obtain all the information we need through non-coercive interrogation techniques. Well, but we also know that the FBI has been locked in a perennial uh, six-decade turf war with the CIA, um, and wants to acquire for itself uh, interrogation responsibilities, and otherwise would go to its bureaucratic rival. Um, so we can't really draw too many firm conclusions on the basis of CIA representations or FBI representations. Um, so, the question, does it work? I don't know. Um, there's not enough evidence in the public record for me to be able to say conclusively, uh, yes, we should be engaging in severely coercive interrogation techniques because it works and it's the only way to get this information. But at the same time, I also don't think the public record has enough information for us to be able to draw the opposite conclusion. The coercive interrogation never works. There are always other techniques that will elicit the information we seek. Um, this is why my claim is ultimately one for preserving flexibility, right? We ought to have in the tool shed, 
particular set of techniques that can be used uh, if circumstances warrant. What techniques? Um, again, I want to go back to 